Paying the ultimate price? We ask whether the death penalty still has a place in modern society. Also on today's program, the new battleground between East and West as tempers flare in the Baltic Sea. We ask why Estonia is bolstering its defense forces. And in picture this, Chernobyl may have been abandoned by people for almost 30 years, but its wildlife is surviving and thriving in the nuclear exclusion zone. Hello and welcome to the Newsmakers with me, Imran Garta. Last year, more people were executed by governments than in any other year since 1989. Amnesty International says at least 1,634 people were put to death, a 54% increase on the year before. But on the other hand, in that same year, four countries abolished the death penalty. And for the first time in history, the majority of the world's countries did not use capital punishment. But why are those states that have it using it more than ever? And in the 21st century, is it ever justifiable to take a life for a life? In a moment, I'll be talking to Anthony Graves, a man who spent 18 years in prison, 12 of them on death row, before being exonerated. Today's newsmaker is the death penalty. State-sanctioned killings, the ultimate punishment handed down for heinous crimes. Despite growing global condemnation and more countries choosing to abolish, last year saw the highest number of executions worldwide in more than 25 years. According to Amnesty International, at least 1,634 people were executed in 25 countries in 2015. Most were carried out in five countries, China, Iran, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia and the US. Amnesty says the figures in China are unclear, but it believes thousands were executed there. This organization you mentioned often has some biased reviews on China, and we don't have comment on that. Iran alone accounted for 82% of executions in the Middle East, with at least 977. Pakistan lifted a six-year moratorium on execution of civilians in December 2014, following a Taliban attack on a school in Peshawar. Last year, it executed 326 people. 158 were executed in Saudi Arabia in 2015, a 76% increase on the previous year, while 28 people were put to death in the US. But on the other hand, four more countries banned the death penalty in 2015, and Mongolia will abolish it later this year. The United States a leading world power, a beacon of democracy, and a champion of human rights. It was also the fifth highest executor in 2015. While the numbers are falling, seven fewer were executed than in 2014, and it was the lowest number since 1991. But 31 states still have the death penalty, and pressure to end it is mounting. The EU has an export ban on the drugs used in lethal injections, and stocks are running low. What happened in Oklahoma was deeply troubling. In September 2014, convicted murderer and rapist Clayton Lockett was given a concoction of drugs in what should have been a fast-working lethal injection. But he lived for 43 minutes in apparent pain. In the application of the death penalty in this country, we have seen uh, significant problems. Racial bias, uh, an uneven uh, application situations in which there were individuals on death row who uh, later on were discovered uh, to have been innocent because of uh, exculpatory evidence. For the majority of Americans, the death penalty is a vital part of the justice system. According to Pew Research, 56% agree with it for those convicted of murder. But overall support is declining. It's as low as it's been in 40 years. With questions about the fairness of trials and whether capital punishment does work as a deterrent, many within the US and around the world say it's time for it to be abolished completely. Yvette McCullough, The Newsmakers.
Well, joining me now to discuss the death penalty from Houston, Texas, is Anthony Graves, a man who spent 12 years on death row before being exonerated. And in Philadelphia, we have the president of the Crime Prevention Research Center, John Lott, who believes capital punishment is the most efficient way of stopping crime. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. John Lott, is your argument for the death penalty utilitarian or moral? It's purely utilitarian. <clears throat> it's a question of deterrence. Uh, you know, just as you can deter criminals with higher arrest rates or higher conviction rates, the fact that in certain crimes the death penalty is available clearly deters uh, the number of murders that are there. I mean, you see this in many different ways. I mean, one simple example is how when you have plea bargains that occur, that simply the threat of the death penalty causes people to agree to uh, first-degree murder charges so you don't have to go through and have... Uh, have the criminal trial that's there. Anthony Graves, it's a deterrent. You spent 12 years on death row, you were exonerated, 18 years in total in prison. When you hear that, how do you respond? Well, I say that uh, the death penalty hasn't shown to be a deterrent in any state that practices it. For example, in the South. In the South, you have like 80% of the people that get executed come from the South. You have the highest crime rate in the South. But go to the Northeast, less than 1% of the people getting executed is in the Northeast, and you have less crime in the Northeast. So this whole notion about it being a deterrent, I, I, I don't understand where they come from. John, you buy any of that? Uh, see, here's the problem. The places that adopt the death penalty are the ones that have the highest death rate or murder rate to begin with. And what you see is that after they adopt the death penalty, there's a drop in murder rates in those places relative to what they were before. And you see drops in those places relative to the states that didn't choose to change their rules with regard to the death penalty. There's clear evidence that those states that have the most uh, executions have the biggest relative drops in murder rates relative to other places. They still may be higher than some other places, but they're much lower than they were in the past. John, I want to ask you about whether the system is very flawed. I mean, you, you have Anthony Graves, who's a, who's a victim of the system, right? Is it just sim as simple as telling him, hey, we got it wrong, we're sorry we screwed up your entire life, um, bad things happened, there was a bad prosecutor, bad luck, glitch in the system. Is that acceptable, John? Look, I mean, nobody wants mistakes to occur. The question is, at what rate do the mistakes occur? And when you look at, so there's 130 people they claim that have been exonerated. In fact, most of those cases actually involve legal changes, changes in the definition by the courts in terms of what's classified as murders. But when you look at actual exonerations, you're talking about something that's way less than 1% of the cases. Should it be even less than 1%? Sure. I mean, it'd be great to try to reduce that as much as possible. but. You know, you look at violent crimes in general that have been uh, changed as a result of DNA evidence, and there you're talking about tenths or hundreds of 1%. And so the question is, how many lives do you save versus how many times do you have mistakes? It'd be great if there were zero mistakes. Nobody wants to have any of these mistakes that occur. And in, in the individual's case that we're talking to, uh, you have it so that he's been given millions of dollars in terms of trying to compensate him. Is that going to compensate him? No. But at least at least it tries to, to help him out a little bit to make up for the lost years that he had there. But so the question is, can we save lives? Is this an effective way to try to do that? And how do we balance that off in terms of having mistakes that are way less than you know, 1% or, you know, tenths or hundreds okay. of a percent, depending upon the crime you're looking a Anthony, at. Anthony, in the bigger picture, then, the argument is you're a statistical minority and you've been given millions of dollars in order to try to make up for that's, it. That's not even an argument. That's not even an argument. That's an excuse to, to, to continue to practice an, in, an inhumane practice because of the fact that this, 156 men have been exonerated from, a, from the death, death penalty across this nation. That means that we know for a fact that had we executed those men, we would have, no, we have, we have, would have knownly 
executed 156 innocent men. So the question to me is this, if we're executing mostly guilty men, 99% guilty men, and we're executing a few innocent men, is that enough to keep the death penalty? Because that's what is actually happening. So are, are, are we saying that it is okay to execute one innocent person as long as we're executing 100 guilty people? Because that's the question. Whether you believe in the death penalty or whether you do not believe in the death penalty is not even a question when it comes to this practice. The question is, does it work? And I can tell you, sitting in my seat, that it does not work. And I can also tell you from the, basically, for the other 150, 55 men that walked out of there that you cannot tell their parents that it's okay that we gave them a million dollars and they should be okay now mm -hmm. because a million dollars has not erased the memories of my mind when I witnessed over five or 350 executions when I witnessed men going out of their minds when I witnessed men slitting their throats when I witnessed men dropping their pills because of the conditions when I witnessed men literally literally just going insane at the age of 19 25 60 you can't tell me that it's okay for that man to experience that type of torture give him a million dollars and he's okay Okay. It does John, not work that way. Let me bring John in John if well, if the system was yeah. more efficient Can the man you're debating would be would be dead already, wouldn't he? Well, I mean, one thing to point out is there's been no cases that I think anybody agrees on that somebody's been could, a, executed when they shouldn't have been. They've been cases where people have been convicted and in the process of review have been re released for various reasons, not just exoneration. It's been in many cases, you've had the courts change what they define it, it as the crime or whether if you're, you can be guilty. And so, and so, I, I, it doesn't and look, matter. and it's more a than millions of dollars. We're talking about tens of millions of dollars given to these individuals. But the question is, what do you say to the people whose lives would be lost because you weren't able to deter these criminals? You okay. know, the, no, that's a, it's that's an horrible interesting question. Yeah, it's somebody, an interesting question. even though they weren't executed, were having to spend some time in, in sure. jail. Okay, but let me ask Anthony. Is, what do you say to the people? Let who, me take that and, and develop it a little you, bit, John. What do I want to ask Anthony. To, what do Anthony, you say to my mother? Sure. A Anthony, what if you'll allow me. What do you say to me. my mother who lost her son to a system? Okay. And, that, and that's very powerful. Well, and, and apologies yes. for interrupting you. Anthony, let, let me ask you, let me take this a bit further. Do you believe the man who did kill those six people that you were initially convicted of, of killing on that night in 1992, Robert Earl Carter, the man who murdered those six, including four kids aged four to nine. Then he lied about your involvement for eight years before recanting, just before he was executed. He was a child killer, he was a, he was a liar, he was, he was a bad man. And he was executed. Was his execution just, Anthony? Well, well let me, let me, let me kind of back up and kind of... He, he, he uh, recanted the same night, okay? It was 10 years before they, it was discovered that he had already been telling them that I was innocent. They, they withheld that. They, they lied. They went after his wife and told him, basically, you continue to lie or we're going to go after you. We're going to charge your wife with capital murder. So that is the facts of that case. But was, was, if this man, and I say if because I don't know, but if this man indeed killed these six people, then to me, there had to have been some mental issues. There have to have been some mitigating circumstances that had allowed a man to just go and kill six innocent people. I don't think someone just wakes up and decides to go kill six innocent people. Okay, if there he did it, some mitigating Anthony, factors there. okay. I mean, it seems as if he did it. If he did if, do it, should he be sitting in a jail funded by the taxpayer until he dies rather than being executed as he was? Well, well, well let, me, let, me, let me break this also down to you. Okay, when you talk about the death penalty versus a life without parole, let me just say this, you're talking about two death sentences. So the choice is this, do you want to poison, poison this man's uh, body with, with, with fluid and kill him, or do you want him to die of natural causes because you got two death sentences on the table. There's no such thing as a life without parole behind bars. You're there till you die, unless you put poison in his vein first. Do we as a society want to treat him inhumanely? Or do we want to treat him humanely until he dies? Because he's there forever, until he takes his last breath. That's the question. So whether we pump poison in his veins or whether we just let him die of natural causes, it is the death penalty. And so I would say, yes, he deserved the death penalty, but he should die of natural causes. Okay. Because who are we 
to decide to play golf. Okay. Okay, point well made. Um, John, I want to ask you, you know, the Pew Research Center survey finds 56% of Americans favor the death penalty for people convicted of murder, while 38% are opposed to it. But since the 1960s, that first figure seems to be going down, the second going up. There seems to be a slow evolution of American views. At some point in a U.S. democracy, it seems as if, given the trend, most people will be against the death penalty. Does that naturally suggest to you that at some point there has to be a federal ban because the people want it? Well, look, there are lots of different polls that are out there. The Pew poll at 56% is by far the lowest that I know of on this. A lot of the polls are in the mid to high 60 range. You actually have some that are 70%. And again, depending upon the poll that you look at, it determines whether or not it's been fairly constant or whether it's been falling. The Pew, again, is relatively unusual in terms of showing a decline there. But even if somehow there was a temporary decline, that doesn't mean that you don't see increases again in the future. I mean, surely anybody who's looked at polls of politicians or whatever know these things go up and down over time. And if, if it does go down, then they can go and change it. But you know, as long as most of the polls are showing 67, 68, 69 percent of the American people strongly support uh, be able to go and have this as an option. You know, it's not used that often. You just can't murder somebody. You have to murder them, and there has to be what's called special circumstances, right. which means did they go and do it in a particularly heinous way? Did they torture the people before they went and right. killed them? Uh, you know, and, and in those cases where you have those special circumstances, a lot of people believe that this type of deterrence, if it can save some lives, and there's a lot of statistical evidence. The vast majority of studies done by common sure. economists and criminologists show that for each execution, you save about eight lives. Uh, John, there. we don't have that's, much time. I want one final question you know, for you. Sorry to interrupt you. I want fi one final question for you and then a final word from Anthony. But sure. I'm going to start with you, John. Just broadening this out a little bit, in terms of modern, wealthy, industrialized nations, the U.S. is a bit of an outlier on this issue. The U.S. is quoted in the same sentence as China, Saudi Arabia, Iran, and Pakistan whenever we're looking at the numbers of people executed every year. Are you comfortable with being in the same basket as these countries when it comes to the death penalty? As an American, are you comfortable with that? Look, I mean, they execute for completely different reasons. For China, it's a lot to do with political stuff. There's no political executions that occur in the United States. You have to go and murder multiple people. They have to be special circumstances that are there. We have terrorism that occurs. I mean, you mentioned 28 people were executed in the United States. And all those other countries, you were talking about, you know, thousands in China, hundreds in other countries that are there. The issue is, why do we do it in the United States? We do it, at least a lot of people do it, in order to try to save other lives. Okay. And okay. so that seems to me a completely different reason for doing it. Okay, Anthony Graves, the U.S. is different from other countries because you do it to try to save other lives. There are no political executions. Final word from you, please, sir, because we are running out of time. Well, I, I just go back to the fact that whether you believe in the death penalty or not, I, I think that's, that's a personal choice. It definitely is. But I don't think our emotions should govern our society. It should come from a rational state of mind. And I believe that when we are shown that 156 men have been exonerated from this inhumane punishment, that means that common sense says that someone didn't make it and we've executed someone innocent. Now, are we comfortable with that? Because we are executing mostly innocent, I mean, guilty people. But if we execute a few along the way that are innocent, are we comfortable with that? It doesn't matter about what you believe in. Yeah. Are you comfortable with executing innocent people? Okay, gentlemen, unfortunately, time is our enemy. We it has an been innocent. an absorbing discussion. Sorry, John. I've got to wrap because I've got to move on to other stuff. But John Lott and Anthony Graves, thank you very much for joining us. Still to come on the Newsmakers, we meet the volunteer army on the front line and the fault line between East and West. And in picture this, why Chernobyl's nuclear exclusion zone has become an unexpected haven for animals. A Russian military jet has flown within 10 meters of a U.S. warship in the Baltic Sea in what the White House says was a simulated attack. 
and one of the riskiest encounters for decades. It's the latest surge in tensions in the Baltic region, where some are worried Russia will try to repeat its tactics from Ukraine. NATO has pledged enhanced protection, but some are taking matters into their own hands. The newsmaker Simon McGregor Wood filed this report from Estonia. Russia's actions in Ukraine and Crimea have sent shockwaves through Eastern Europe. Poland and the three Baltic states fear they could be next. NATO plans to send more troops and equipment to deter any Russian aggression. The US will quadruple its spending on European defense, $3.4 billion in 2017 alone. Putin, in my second term, uh, has had an increasing tendency to view the world through a Cold War prism. This statement that Russia is a security threat is used by countries that want to portray Russia as an enemy. We will not compromise on the principles on which our reliance and the security of Europe and North America rest. 250 U.S. tanks and armored vehicles will be deployed on NATO's eastern borders. 4,200 new U.S. troops will be rotated through the vulnerable NATO states each year. Will this be enough to reassure nervous NATO allies? Will it provoke the Kremlin? Estonia is one NATO country feeling the chill wind of Russia's new aggressive posture. TRT World has gained exclusive access to an Estonian government document which demands an even greater increase in NATO presence in the Baltic region. It calls for two combat-ready brigades. That's around 10,000 troops. It wants two squadrons of fighter aircraft, about 40 planes. And it wants the US to maintain a permanent naval presence in the Baltic Sea. Estonia's politicians are convinced they need this level of commitment. That Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania are frontline nations. NATO has to uh, create more visible uh, deterrence. For now, Estonia must rely on its volunteers, like this group, learning how to take out enemy vehicles with a mine. 15,000 unpaid part time soldiers, the first line of defense against Russian incursion. Lisa Maimets is a teacher learning how to lay an anti-tank mine. I do feel the threat, and uh, that's why I, I believe that it's important to be uh, ready. So uh, this kind of action here is very important, I think. In the last two years, the number of people joining Estonia's Defence League has gone up by 10%, a link, some would say, with Russia's actions in Ukraine. It is clear that some Estonians do perceive a new level of threat from their Russian neighbour. Just like Ukraine, Estonia has its own Russian minority. Here in Narva, 90% are ethnically Russian. Moved here in Soviet times, communist factories have closed, unemployment has gone up, many feel left out. There are some concerns that just as in Ukraine and just as in Crimea, the grievances of the Russian minority here might be manipulated by Russia, creating a pretext for a much more obvious intervention. Estonia's weekend warriors practice repelling a Russian incursion. They fear, without a much bigger and more visible NATO deterrence here, they would quickly be overrun. Simon McGregor Wood, The Newsmakers, Estonia. In today's picture this, as we approach the 30th anniversary of the Chernobyl nuclear disaster, photographer Vasily Fedosenko has captured these extraordinary images of wildlife thriving in the nuclear exclusion zone. Let's take a look.
Today's newsmaker has been the death penalty. On the program, I was joined by a man who spent 12 years on death row before being proven innocent. It begs the question of whether this punishment, the ultimate punishment, can ever be justified when it could end the life of an innocent person. But its proponents, like John Lott, argue it deters people from carrying out serious crimes, ultimately keeping us all safer. 70 years ago, only eight countries had abolished the death penalty, while today, more than half the world's countries have done so. So the world appears to be moving towards a place with no capital punishment. But will it ever get there? You've been watching this edition of The Newsmakers with me, Imran Garda, as always. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.